Alexander Rubinstein, you are an independent reporter and you recently have written a very important article with Max Blumenthal in the Gray Zone. And the title of the article says how Ukraine's Jewish president Zelensky made peace with neo-Nazi paramilitaries on front lines of war with Russia. I've been covering uh, recently the war in Ukraine and the issue of the neo-Nazis is very important, especially that the, the, a lot of European and Western government, let's say, are turning a blind eye uh, to the existence of neo-Nazi groups. And not only that, uh, today I just saw on a Ukrainian verified account that the first batch of weaponry has arrived to Azov Brigade, which is a neo-Nazi group there and even instructors from, from NATO, and they're publicly uh, now publishing it. So I think it's important to address this issue. And to begin with, I, I would really like to know who are the neo-Nazi groups? What are their names and their manpower? Are they really strong or it's an exaggeration from the Russian side to, uh, to justify its attack on Ukraine? Because President Putin said, we are there to denazify Ukraine, right? Yeah. Uh, so. I actually saw a tweet uh, a couple days ago that identified six organizations that are uh, neo-Nazi or ultra-nationalist, which in Ukraine is is basically the same thing. Um, but I didn't talk about all of them in my article. I really tried to focus on Zelensky's ties to these, these fascist organizations. Um, so the primary ones that I focus on our C14, which it was uh, started as the youth wing of the Svoboda party, uh, which is an ultra-nationalist party founded by Ola Tanya Buck. He, he used to be real tight with uh, Joe Biden and Victoria Newland back during the coup days and all those players. There's photos of him doing this Nazi sig hell and also with him shaking hands with Joe Biden. But C14 was started as their youth group. So that's one of the organizations I focus on. Another one is uh, Azov Battalion, which uh, has, of course, been incorporated into the Ukrainian National Guard. Uh, another one I talk about is Right Sector, which uh, kind of split into multiple factions, uh, part of which was incorporated into the Ukrainian military, part of which wasn't. However, uh, the longtime leader, a uh, guy by the name of Yarosh, mm -hmm. uh, he is advising the Ukrainian military as we speak. This was announced uh, late November of last year. So what I tried to show in my article, because really like the, the evidence of uh, of neo-Nazism in Ukraine is overwhelming. It's if BuzzFeed were to do a 100 point list listicle of photographic and video evidence of this, uh, it, it would need to be like a, a, a seven or eight part uh, <laughs> listicle because there's it's just overwhelming. I mean, this morning you have uh, NATO itself tweeting photos of Ukrainian fighters with the Nazi black sun uh, on their jacket. Yeah. Um, so that wasn't really within the scope of my article to show the uh, the neo-Nazi renaissance, so to speak, that's happened since 2014, where you have uh, a street or a stadium or a statue being erected to its neo-Nazi era uh, just about every week. My point was to show Zelensky's role in all of this, because you have this uh, line that comes from the mainstream media and, and, also, and also the left, uh, and also part of the right, too, that uh, Ukraine cannot possibly have a neo-Nazi problem because the president himself is Jewish. Mm. Um, but what I show in my article is that he's, he's often actually downplayed his Jewishness. Uh, he's only really making a, a point of pointing it out at the, now that there's this hot war between uh, Ukraine and Russia, and it serves as a... Uh, as a kind of appeal to identity politics and a, simp a simple dismissal of this idea of neo-Nazi infestation of the government and military. Alex, you mentioned the Azov uh, Brigade, and I have written a lot about Azov, and it says, some of the articles say it, it is embedded with the uh, National Guard of Ukraine, and other articles say like they are uh, organically like um, united. Is it a paramilitary group fighting alongside, let's say, the National Guard of Ukraine, or they are organically part of the National Guard? Well, it, it was uh, it was kind of uh, unofficial for mm -hmm. uh, some time. 
Um, but I, I think it was 2014 is actually when it was incorporated uh, after uh, Donetsk and Luhansk uh, mm-hmm. attempted to claim their independence. Um, th- they are now a part of the National Guard. Mm-hmm. And you can see that, I mean, I think it's really important to note that as a battalion was started by a guy named Andrei Bolitsky. Mm-hmm. He has claimed his desire to, quote, lead the white races uh, in the final crusade against the Semite-led intervention. It was started in the city of Kharkiv, which, uh, you know, I encourage people to look at maps of mm-hmm. Ukraine because uh, because it's it, it really gives you a better picture of what's going on. Kharkiv is uh, to the north of the Donbass. Yes. Um, so that's where that's where Azov was started. Uh, in the south, to the south of Donbass is Mariupol, which we're hearing a lot yes. of headlines about these days. Uh, that's where Azov Battalion has its headquarters. And even Western-funded NGOs like the Open Democracy have stated before that Mariupol, uh, Azov has de facto control uh, over it. Uh, mm-hmm. Since Basically, since uh, Azov overtook the uh, the airport in Mariupol in 2014 from the Russian separatists, uh, they've had de facto political control over, over the city uh, and its surrounding villages. So now uh, that it's like, you have to understand that Azov has incredible influence in Kharkiv. It has de facto control over Mariupol. And these are to the north and south of Donbass. Yes. So Azov has been the the fighting force on the front lines, the primary most effective uh, fighting force uh, against the the communist Russian separatists. Yes. So I mean, I think that's that's really overlooked. But now you see all these headlines about how Russia is denying humanitarian corridors to Mariupol. Mm. Yet I'm I'm looking around and I'm seeing videos of Azov <laughs> fighters gunning down people trying to flee. They want to use them as human shields um, so that they can frame Russia for, for attacking civilians. I've seen countless videos of Azov fighters uh, inside, um, inside schools. Um, there was one uh, telegram post I found from, from the National Courts, w- which is the uh, political party of Azov Battalion, uh, where they say that they're going to overtake the administrative building in Kharkiv uh, the following day. The day after they overtook it, there's footage of uh, it being hit by a Russian airstrike. So yes. what they're using is they're what they're doing is is they're trying to uh, hide themselves in civilian infrastructure so that uh, one Russia is less likely to hit it, and two, if they do hit it, then they can say, oh well, look, Russia's attacking humanitarian. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, civilian <laughs> infrastructure. Yeah, this is this is exactly the same strategy of the uh, Islamist groups in Syria, especially uh, when it comes to Idlib nowadays where um, the Salafist groups, especially the Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, Al-Qaeda, and other uh, terrorist groups are, they live among the people. Yeah. They don't have like military headquarters or training camps that you can uh, target. They are embedded with, with the people there, right? So any attack against these groups will definitely result in uh, civilian casualties. And they are, they live on blood, right? Like. Wh- as long as there is bloodshed in Idlib for them, they will have, um, they will continue their fighting there. So they are just, uh, it's like their oxygen, let's say. Uh, yeah. I was I was reading some reports um, in 2014 when the Russian-backed separatists were advancing from Donetsk to uh, Mariupol. Uh, I have I have read that uh, they were the neo-Nazis and the Azov that they pushed back the uh, the the Russian back separatists back then, uh, and the Ukrainian army collapsed. Right. So correct me if I'm uh, if I'm wrong. What is the manpower of Azov, for example? Do they uh, do they have like a ten thousand fighters in, in in Ukraine? Yeah, I mean, I would think so. I I don't I I can't answer that uh, question definitively. Um, but they are a huge fighting force, uh, and it's not just Azov. It's Idar. Uh, which is funded by the same, it's actually funded by the same Jewish Ukrainian oligarch that uh, was the the main backer of Zelensky's presidency. Um, but uh, no, I, I can't say for sure what exactly their fighting force is. Mm-hmm. I'm actually, I'm sure it's actually much higher uh, than it was uh, just a month ago, because even if Russia is killing Azov fighters, uh, they're getting way more through uh, foreign recruits. Yes. Uh, the Ukrainian government is currently doing that openly. In Syria, it was hidden. 
right? The the rat line of uh, foreign fighters to Al Qaeda affiliates was was hidden. Now the Ukrainian uh, government is doing it openly on the internet. They have a dedicated website they've set up to recruit foreign fighters. So um, I, I'm sure that any losses that have been incurred on the Azov side uh, have have been replenished through this campaign. Uh, it's it's very open. Like uh, the foreign minister of you of uh, the UK, she mentioned clearly that she supports um, the traveling or joining uh, the Ukrainian war by any uh, um, British uh, national, right? And we all know who's gonna go, who's gonna fight alongside the uh, the let's say this ultra nationalist and uh, i was uh, with uh, george gallery the other day i of course i called them just like a uh, brainless people but these people believe in an ideology and yeah. the people who joined isis al-qaeda in syria they believed in an in a great cause and these people also believe in a great cause so they will be the ones who are fighting till the end against the russians and it seems for me uh, of course the european union and the us they know they know very well that um, this will lead into uh, they are creating a nest for the neo-Nazis and the ultra-nationalists in Ukraine. But as long as they are fighting Russia, that's fine. And the same thing they did in Syria. As long as ISIS, Al-Qaeda are fighting Assad, that's fine. Um, but do you expect uh, a blowback, um, th this policy to be counterproductive? I mean, let's remember, Afghanistan, late 70s and early 80s, they supported the Mujahideen. And what happened after that? We had the Taliban and we had uh, Al-Qaeda and we had 9-11. So, and in Syria, we know that uh, it's very clear, uh, even if, if the United States didn't support directly ISIS, but they were supporting ISIS through the so-called moderate rebels who were selling the weapons to ISIS or ISIS was taking sure. over this, this weaponry, right? Do you think this will have... Uh, um, let's say a, a repercussion on the European Union, especially that Ukraine is 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 the closest uh, to the European Union to to Poland. Would there be any blowback against the European Union? Do you think these neo-Nazi groups will turn their backs on the European Union on a later stage? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and and just to point out uh, the blowback from Syria. I mean, there were terror attacks in in Manchester and Paris. Um, and and I think that the blowback is going to be. Uh, there are two. There are going to be two facets facets of it. One, one is already happening. Uh, the price of goods of shipping goods uh, via air from China to the to Europe has increased by eighty percent. Mm -hmm. So there's already that blowback. And, and let's face it, Europe gets a lot of its goods from China, um, and the price of oil is is also uh, you know going to affect uh, the European citizens. And then the other side of it is that these neo Nazis have uh, absolutely no affinity for the European Union. Yevon Kata is the leader of C14, an organization that has carried out pogroms against Romani people, has uh, signed agreements with the Kiev municipal government and other local governments. Um, he, he has said himself that the European family has already collapsed. Yes. They, they, don't, they don't love Europe. They believe in Ukrainian national power. Uh, I, I found an interview with a leader of Azov Battalion who said that his ultimate goal is for Ukraine to have nuclear weapons. Um, and and Katas himself has also said that uh, that they will create problems for Europe. Uh, it's it's not about it's not about uh, being in the Western sphere as it supposedly was uh, during during the Maidan coup. It's about Ukrainian national power um, and. You know, I think that you're so correct to point out parallels between Afghanistan and Syria. Uh, Operation Cyclone gave billions of dollars of weapons to the Mujahideen training, uh, including Osama bin Laden and what, what would become the Taliban. Um, Syria, Syria uh, much the same with uh, the, the arming of Al-Qaeda affiliates um, or Al-Qaeda-like groups. Um, and in Ukraine, it's going to be, I mean, we can see from Hillary Clinton, Joe Biden, uh, Anthony Blinken, all of them have said things to the effect of making this a long, dirty war. Um, yes. So so, so that's going to be the model. Uh, and and it's, I mean, people are, people went to Syria, foreign fighters went to Syria because they were enamored by this idea of, a, of an Islamic caliphate. Uh, people are going to Ukraine because they're enamored by the idea of the Fourth Reich. 
So it's not, it's not about, it's not about Europe. It's about overtaking Europe. Actually, their ambition is to both overtake Europe and Russia. Alex, I live in Germany and I know the, the position of the political parties here. And I'm saying this with a, a, with a heavy heart, with a pain in my chest, all uh, left-wing parties, in exception to just few MPs from the Linke party, which is the left party, the few MPs, huh? Sure. Only the right-wing party, the far-right party, condemned the sending weapons to Ukraine and asked for the end of the war in Ukraine and also said they don't want a, a Ukraine to be part of NATO and they said Russia is, uh, deserves to be respected and we shouldn't provoke Russia. Okay. My, uh, there, is, there is this question that I cannot really answer. I'm not finding an answer. How did the left wing or the liberals ended up always siding with the wrong side? For example, in Syria, I'm not saying, the, look, the wrong side for them, like they sided with uh, the so-called rebels who would stone, they, they stone women to death and they throw the homosexuals from the rooftops of buildings. Yeah. Uh, they oppress the minorities. If you are an atheist, agnostic, you, you're going to end up being crucified. And now in Ukraine, the same people, like these liberals who believe in uh, human rights, democracy, or they say so, uh, LGBT rights, yeah. for example, they are supporting a kind of people in Ukraine They have who, who hold an ideology that goes against their um, values, right? How is this happening, seriously? Well, at least in the United States, the left is deeply propagandized. And, and from what I can tell in, in Germany as well, um, it was really interesting because uh, there was a small faction of leftists in the United States that were very pro-Idlib, right? Very in support of uh, these uh, Salafi uh, jihadists. Um, most of the left in the United States was in support of the uh, Syrian Democratic Forces, the SDF yes. or, the, or the YPG, which was created at the insistence of the United States. Yes. Um, so, you know, and, and they, they justified their support for them uh, because they said that they were against federalism and, and the system of governance that the uh, SDF was carrying out in, in northeastern Syria was... Um, was uh, community based, right? Um, it was it was not a centralized state. So I, you know, I I posed this question some time ago. Um, how how did those people who are U.S. proxies uh, get support from the Western left when the people of Donbas uh, who who attempted their own you know kind of uh, localized government um, were were just totally rejected? Um, it doesn't make any sense. And, and, and you realize after a time that it's not, it's not the political system that matters. It's, it's, it's the left is going to support whoever serves the, the United States empire. Yes. And I think that's just a result of, of, of propaganda because I mean, look, you know, we say that the, the right-wing parties in Germany are Nazis. That's what the left says here. And now it's the right-wing parties in Germany that are not supporting Nazis. Um, you have this, you have this like anti-Nazi zealotry that's that's uh, embedded in in, in left-wing ideology, and it's just totally thrown out the window here. I mean, I look, I was in Charlottesville uh, during the showdown between neo-Nazis and and Antifa, um, and a lot of the neo-Nazis that had carried out violence there were trained with the Azov Battalion. Um, and this has been totally ignored in in the in today's context and totally forgotten. And it's uh, and again, you know, you have uh, LGBT rights as like a a main pillar of left wing ideolo ideology. Uh, as a battalion, C fourteen, right sector. These are all groups that have carried out attacks on any kind of LGBT demonstration. So it's totally hypocritical. And 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 the only the only conclusion I can come to personally is that the left is going to support whoever serves empire because that's who the media tells them to. I mean, the Azov politicians or those officials or responsible of Azov, they made it clear that in 2014, 
um, although they consisted of maybe eight to 10%, but they were the strongest force on the ground because they were the ones fighting the security force, right? It's not the people yeah. who were carrying the uh, rainbow flags or, or yeah, yeah. And, and he said he said it clearly, were it not for us, the, the 2014 revolution would have ended up like a gay pirate. This is how he yeah. calls it. So it's pretty obvious that they have, they are antagonizing the LGBT community. And I was having some conversation with a friend here and um, he's a very uh, art supporter of the LGBT community in Berlin. And he said, yeah, we know there, there are lots of neo-Nazi groups now in, in, in um, Ukraine, but at the moment they are uh, with, the, with the Ukrainian people. I was really mind blown, you know, like, how, how can you say that? And, and these people are activists, they're collecting money here, and they're even collecting money uh, to the Ukrainian forces. This is what they say. So they're collecting money through social media. They're sending it to the Ukrainian forces. And I warned them, this is, this will end up in the hands of the neo-Nazis guys because they're the ones who are going to fight till the end. The Ukrainian army will collapse. Just give it a few weeks and you will see Kiev will, will fall. And the entire south till Odessa uh, will be occupied by Russia. They will turn just Ukraine into an inland and then they will uh, occupy Kiev and, and Zelensky will uh, run away. He will escape. He will go to Poland. Maybe they, they will create some. Um, well, what, uh, what, what uh, my article shows is that throughout Zelensky's presidency, he's had no power to uh, stop the, the agenda of these neo-Nazi groups. They're, they're more powerful than he is. Uh, despite uh, being electorally unpopular, did he try? Did he try? Did he try to stop them? Did he try to contain them? What did he try to do? This is well, an important I, question. I, I wanted to ask you. Yeah. So I mean, uh, he he, without a doubt, got elected on a platform of of peace with Russia. Um, mm. That that was his main, you know, selling point. Uh, the coalition of neo Nazi political organizations that ran against him got two point one five percent of the vote. So it's it's Putin is absolutely correct. He, nobody's saying that you that the neo Nazis are are the government, right? But the Ukrainian government uses these neo Nazis to enact terror against against their opponents. Um, and I mean, Z Zelensky was at odds with them, right, for a long time. Uh, it came down to a situation where he was trying to implement what's called the Steinmeier formula. Uh, conceived by the former foreign minister of Germany, um, Steinmeier. which, yeah, which would, would have uh, allowed for independent elections in the Donbass. Um, so this is, this is like what was popular, peace with Russia. Uh, Putin has said himself that, that uh, the people of Ukraine are held hostage by neo-Nazis. Um, so this is what was popular. The neo-Nazis stopped it. They stopped that process from happening. Uh, through their movement, which they called no capitulation. And it came down to a situation where uh, Zelensky went to a city called Zalot and ordered the Azov battalion to leave um, because he, there was supposed to be a troop withdrawal and they refused. And he embarrassed himself on camera. He said, you know, I'm, I'm not a loser. I'm, I'm the president and I'm 42 years old. Yeah. You know, if I tell you to stand down, you have to stand down. They didn't. Uh, Andre <laughs> Belitsky, the, the Azov leader, threatened to send more fighters. Um, and so what happened is that Zelensky found himself consulting with these neo-Nazis about the peace process with Russia. Uh, they have already claimed to have thwarted it themselves. Um, one of the people he met with, again, Yevon Kadas, this genocidal guy who wants to break Russia up into five parts and oversees this organization that uh, carries out these like insane, ultra-violent pogroms against Romani people, um, taking axes to their tents and burning things to the ground. Um, so, I mean, even in the beginning of Zelensky's presidency, uh, his prime minister and his minister of veteran affairs were going to neo-Nazi concerts organized by C-14 where, where like metal bands, you know, <laughs> play, played to uh, these like skinhead audiences. Hmm. Um, in fact, his minister of veteran affairs promoted the event on Facebook. So as, as uh, it became clear that Zelensky was not able to rein in these neo-Nazis, it was kind of a situation where it's like, if, if you can't beat them, join them. And that's what he did. He hmm. consulted them with, on the peace process, as I said. Uh, today, Yarosh, uh, the former leader of right sector, is advising the Ukrainian military. 
Um, and he gave the Hero of Ukraine Award to a, a commander of Right Sector. So Right Sector actually splintered in, in 2015, and about 130, which is not that many, um, of its members uh, decided it was okay to join the uh, Ukrainian military if, if, if the military agreed to let them serve in the same company. So a lot of the fighters are also like um, paramilitary, right? Um, but the, one of the guys who, it, who is uh, with right sector in the military, uh, he, he was given the Hero of Ukraine Award by Zelensky himself. This is a guy who brags to – he keeps a wolf in a cage where mm. his people are, are, are based, and he tells reporters that come that he feeds the bones of Russian children to it. Yeah. So these are the kind of characters that, that Zelensky has honored, has sat at the table with. And uh, offered like a like a, a say in in the affairs of of the state. Wow, um, no comment on that. <laughs> do, 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 just last question for you, Alex. Do you think this the the West is trying to create a quagmire for Russia now in Ukraine for for the Russian army to stuck in a long term. Uh, war of attrition there to a resistance, or this will end up uh, soon through diplomacy or military means? Well, I, I don't have a crystal ball, so I, I don't know how it's going to turn out. Uh, I, I think that um, the people of Europe, the people of Russia, the United States, um, and especially the people of Ukraine will be much better off if there's a peace agreement, um, just, just hands down. Uh, I, I do think, however, that it's better uh, for the United States, if that's not the case, if it turns into a long, dirty war, uh, just like Syria, where you have um, this influx of fighters and weapons from the West um, going into the hands of these uh, fascist uh, zealots who, who want nothing more than a Fourth Reich and are willing to engage in protracted warfare for the next five, 10 years um, to just chip away at Russia, m- Russian morale, Russian the Russian economy, and the Russian um, military. Um, so that's that's the worst case scenario. But uh, if you if you look at statements from Joe Biden himself during the State of the Union, uh, Hillary Clinton on on the mainstream media, um, and, and Anthony Blinken in, in his uh, addresses from the State Department, this is, this is certainly the goal, and it's not it's not. Um, it's not unprecedented. That's yeah. exactly what they did in Afghanistan and, and exactly what they did in Syria. I agree with you that it is the United States and the UK mostly who are pushing for this uh, type of war in Ukraine. Unfortunately, this is not in, even in the interest in, uh, of the European Union. Uh, but no, because they are really like they are heavily embedded with NATO. And that's not only the case. The United States has a heavy influence on a lot of European countries. And nowadays, after after Merkel left, uh, United States has more influence over Germany, especially. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm serious. I, I don't um, doubt it. I don't doubt it. Merkel, Merkel, of course. Merkel was, of course, she was pro NATO, but at the end, she yeah. was she was trying to create some sort of a balance with Russia because of her of the national interests of her own people. Yeah. And now we have the social democrats and the Greens in power, and they are like bulldogs against Russia, like as if this was well planned to bring them in power at this particular time when they have a really anti-Russian rhetoric and they are pushing hard now. And as you can see, uh, the new chancellor of Germany decided to spend uh, 2% on a mili- uh, for a military budget and also in NATO. So we are unfortunately going to see more militarized Germany and not for the sake of Germany. It's for the sake of the United States and for the sake of NATO. This is very unfortunate. For us, uh, I think it is very important that uh, Ukraine uh, would restore its peace and stability. Uh, They would be neutral between NATO and Russia. This would be the best case scenario for the Ukrainians and for the Europeans and for Russians. But uh, it seems that the Americans are pushing for, um, as you mentioned, Hillary Clinton, Joe Biden, Blinken, they're all mentioning this long-term war. And we can see now the fighters are traveling there and the weaponry is arriving now to Azov by NATO and instructors themselves. 
Alexander Rubinstein, it was really a pleasure to have you on Syriana Analysis. Guys, uh, I will put the link of his Twitter account in the description below. Please go and follow him. He's doing a really great job on Ukraine. He's monitoring and documenting lots of incidents happening in Ukraine that uh, a lot of people are missing. So it would be really um, appreciate. I, I would really appreciate if you follow him too. Well, may I say more, more importantly than following me, uh, go to the gray zone. Read, read the article I co-authored with Max Blumenthal and, and share it with whoever you can, your friends, your family. Uh, we, we have to break through this narrative. And if, I, if you don't mind me tooting my own horn, I, I think that the article does a pretty good job of demolishing a lot of the propaganda that we're being fed. It's just so important for our, our own livelihoods, for our own economies, that uh, we don't let them get away with these kind of lies. Guys, I will also add the link of the article in the description. I myself send it to multiple people. So it's a really great read. You have to go through it, take your time and read all the details because it's very important. It's deconstructing lots of realities about the neo-Nazi groups there and how Zelensky is embedded with them nowadays against the Russian forces. Alexander, thank you very much for being my guest. It was really a pleasure. Thanks so much.